So first of all, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this um, our digital introduction to digital mapping. It's going to be a very gentle introduction, taking you through some of the main processes and giving you the ideas about what digital mapping is and how it can be used and how we've used it in a couple of other projects that we've done to support um, other groups. What it isn't is uh, for this morning is a run through of actually how to set up the digital mapping packages on your own um, devices. That is something that if you are interested um, by the end of the workshop, and we hope that some of you will be, but if you're interested to follow, follow that through, then we will be doing other um, workshops specifically to go through all of the different uh, elements and um, so that you're all up and running, or as many people want to be up and running, to actually produce your own digital maps. So that's just by sort of by way of a, a brief introduction. So what the first um, presentation that I'm going to uh, share with you is one that I put together, which is just a general introduction to maps and digital mapping and how this will actually can actually be used. We'll then have a short break, um, sort of a, a comfort, comfort break, if you like. Uh, we'll have a few questions, a break of about five, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll move on to the um, showing people the more technical bits of the um, process uh, with two other further presentations, which will take you right through from what digital mapping is, right through to producing the final outputs um, layered up and all the rest of it. So, um, I'm not much of a, that much of a novice, but I haven't done this for a few weeks, so uh, <laughs> I'm just going to hopefully, hopefully it will all work smoothly. But I'm now going to mute myself. This short presentation is just a by way of an introduction to some of the maps and the way that maps have evolved over the last sort of 200 or so years. Um, I'm just going to go through a few of those that show how um, cartography map making has developed and hopefully show how some of this will then feed into some of the work that we'll be doing um, for Whirlow. So first of all, we're looking at the variety of maps. I mean, you know, nowadays there are so many different types of maps. We've got everything from, you know, the geological, the um, meteorological maps, navigation maps, contour, pictorial, et cetera, et cetera. It's difficult, you know, sometimes to think that, um, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, we didn't have, you know, we were really on the sort of the pictorial end of, end of things with a little bit of um, the survey work just coming in. And as well as the different types of maps, we've also got maps that can be produced nowadays quite simply um, at different scales, different levels of detail and different areas. And also looking at different purposes and um, the multitude of purposes so we can layer the purposes over um, each other. And just going back to the, you know, as I said before, the sort of the, the more pictorial and very basic survey maps that we find from the 18th century. And these are two examples from uh, the Norton area of um, uh, Sheffield, which at the time was, uh, was, was in um, Derbyshire. And the first one on the, on the left-hand side, 
we've got you know just a the basic outlines of the different um fields and the different um buildings that we've got which is just a basic sort of relation thing it has actually got a scale on and it has actually got um a compass so we know where north is and these were fairly sort of um new innovations at the time before that you would just maybe get a, a linear map or just a, a general schematic uh, map uh, which didn't really have the scale as we would know a scale um, today the the map on the right hand side the, the larger map is um the one that samuel shaw uh, commissioned for his norton hall um estate for his park parkland area and at the Norton Hall estate um in the late 18 well mid late 18th century um as a way of him stating you know looking at what his uh domain was at the time and at the time that he was thinking about um remodeling all of the estate and moving it away from the old hall into the more modern um uh, landscape that we see uh, we see today this by the way, is, the, is the old uh, the old london road before chesterfield road was um, was put in and this is norton lane you can see the, the sort of the difference um in scale with some of these but it is uh, you know fairly sort of accurate And just bringing zooming in a little bit onto this uh, onto the map, you see that it is, you know, it's accurate, or uh, it's depicted, you know, down to the individual trees and the extent of the of the ponds and now the the uh, lakes in uh, uh, Grace Park, and each of these trees they're not just there for decoration, and the hedgerows here with the different types of uh, tree. And the standard tree and the sort of the hedge planting trees they are as far as we can tell from the from other information they are actually accurate you know there is an accurate depiction of what was what was there and this is norton church and a couple of the large um trees within within there interestingly none of the other parts of norton are actually shown because it's just about this um the, the actual area that uh, Shaw was interested in. This um, moving on a little bit further into the um, around about 1800s is a Dobbs Enclosure Award map from 1805. These were produced as um, ways of actually dividing up the land between the landowners so they were accurate and it's one of the first sort of like the the really sort of accurate um depictions of of land because it was about who owned what and what their value was in much more sort of detailed than you know um before because it was also a, a legal document so it was something that you know was sort of set down in law and this was your bit and that was somebody else's bit and um you know this was apportioned in the right sort of uh, way so that everybody well not everybody but the um, the large landowners got their fair share and the other people got maybe got a few crumbs uh, on the left hand side you've got a sketch map from the surveyor's notebook so the surveyors would go out with their you know primitive sort of sighting I don't know if the other lights, but the sighting front with their with their chains, a twenty-two yard chains, which uh, you know were actual physical physical chains that were were made so you know for the purpose of doing the the survey. Um, they go out, sketch the map, make all the notes, uh, the areas, uh, give it a reference number, any. Uh, no names or anything like that they put all that in and you know they'd mark out the woodland they mark out the actual um the field system and mark out any buildings 
if you get these and we're very lucky in this area that we've got um in the sheffield archives the fairbanks collection which this notebook is taken from um uh, william fairbanks and um his uh, sons and uh, partners were did huge amounts of really detailed surveying what is good is that they've actually got not just the maps but the accompanying notebook so you've got all of the detail in there this is the um actually the uh, official enclosure enclosure award map which accompanied all the all the more um detail you see it's it's roughly the same but it's a little bit more um style a little bit more you know that the woodlands have got little bits of trees in um, similar to the um estate uh, the uh, enclosure award um maps are the estate sales uh, maps that uh, this is from 1850 the top one again is is of the norton norton estate and if you do get any of these they again they are very good on the detail they are accurately good accurate sort of mapping not always um you know to the same level of detail as some of some of the other maps but they're they're good maps and what is interesting if you can find them is that they've got again you've got the notebooks or the ledgers which give the sales information so you know the ownership in this case is the ownership the tenant the number of the allotted land so this number here the number of the allotted land what the land was or what it was called you know whether it was a woodland whether it was a meadow etc etc the acreage extent of that right down to your rods and your purchase and then the value of it so they you know it's it's a good sort of source document as well as a pictorial representation of the of the area what you also get in the 18th century early 19th century before the ordnance survey really sort of you know was um uh you know, came into came into being was you got you know people were already interested in maps as we've seen you know there's a maps of people estate but also maps of wider areas and some you know sort of private map, map makers they would as as uh, Burdett did um did a, a map of the whole of derbyshire and you see you know this is the uh, this is the derbyshire boundary which um runs yeah, uh, well, runs through from uh, the Sheaf and round the Mears Brook and along the Shire Brook and down the River Rother that way, um, down towards Chesterfield and that way. And you see on the Derbyshire side, there's a lot of detail. You know, not, not in the same accurate level, but, you know, there's a detail of, there's a settlement, there's a name of the settlement, where you've got the large houses, you've got Norton and Shore Esquire and uh, Beechiff Hall, and that's the Peg Burnell um, family. And a lot of this was about where they thought they could sell copies of these maps. So if it was the great and the good, and you marked on the local churches and stuff, the great and the good, they would buy your map. By the 1830, one of the other really nice maps which we can use from this area, and I think we've not checked, but I think it will just stretch over to Werlow. So we've got um, potential for for that area there to be to be on this um, level of detail. It gives detail on the um, all the field boundaries and the um, trees as well as. Uh, places um, you know villages or halls or whatever i think some of this i think some of this was put together um from a lot of the enclosure award acts that so he 
it did it probably did so much of a survey work but a lot of it was stuck together onto a, a survey on, on, on pre-existing survey maps but again it's fascinating detail and these sort of um hatch markings are depict the sort of the hills and the valleys moving on to sort of like i'll come back to the ordnance survey maps but but moving further on into the 20th century this is another um really interesting example of map it's a corporation uh, sheffield corporation with their extension of boundary and that what they were looking at here in the sort of the late 20s they mapped in great detail where all the assets where all the buildings were um you see here that you've got these little red dots which are the newly built houses on the newly built Wellowdale road which is being put through atlesall wood there's some more newly built houses here the the black ones are the pre-existing the old old houses so you can see that Wellow brook hall is already uh, is already on here and this is, is one of these sort of fascinating um, maps that you could spend lots of time on. It's, it covers the whole of um, the south of Sheffield and right up to Ringinlow and Lady Cannings and right down through to Holmesfield and um, Norton, because this was the area that they were uh, looking at taking in the uh, proposed boundary. And then moving, moving sort of backwards, um, just going through sort of the um, the ordnance survey that the it's the facsimile of the first edition of the ordnance survey. And in the one of the things that they did, they did it by county by county. So because we're on the boundary between between South Yorkshire and Derbyshire at this time, this was like 1840, 1850. Um, we get different, we don't get the same map at the same time. So you just have to be a little bit careful that, you know, for the for Derbyshire and for Yorkshire, there's probably about 10 years difference between between the mapping, which is interesting when you see a map because then it, it goes up to the boundary and then it's just a blank white space. But what we can do and what is easy to do with the more modern the digital mapping is we can stick all of those together and come up with something which is a fairly good representation i mean here again you've got the contours that are in um a shade so it's a little bit muddy a little bit murky to actually look at the detail unless you you know really sort of um hold down on it but nevertheless you know they're quite sort of Quite, quite good maps um, of an area. It gives you lots of lots of detail. Moving on um, from the the, uh, the first ordinance survey, I've come back onto the um, the Grey Spot uh, Wood Seats Meadowhead area, and this shows the 1906 um, ordinance survey map, which gives the detail, and it's the more it's the one. I think that if you're looking at maps, it's one that you're probably more used to seeing because it's a more modern, um, still on the old sort of chains and the other light surveyors mark, go to the next point, um, look along the line, measure the line out, um, and then you get your accurate boundaries. But you'll see these accurate and these are you know the fields and the field boundaries that you've got and the croft uh, well the field boundaries for the park farm which is a park farm here and these are the uh, the fields now so you've got the bow hill farm so you've got lots and lots of details on on here which um we can then look at in more detail to see if they're still here on the data maps 
So this is more or less the same. Yeah, well, it is. It is the same view, but you can see just how much has changed in fifty years. Yeah, there's no farmland. They still got Bowhill Farm. There's there's no farmland. There's no farm park farm, and that area has gone. There's no obvious um, field boundaries here. You've still got the rows of trees and you've got more footpaths and things coming in and you've now got you know the, the Jessup the Jessup Hospital there and a war memorial. Moving on to the a modern street view which has been produced digitally again based on ordnance survey detail you see a different and again to our eyes this is a more modern it's it's in colour it's got the blocks of you know the dark green of the woodland this is the open area the greys and the little squares are the the houses and gardens and you know the white white roads but what one of the things that you can do is to actually produce um, a map for your own purposes based on you know whatever you um whatever your interest might be so you know one of the things that we we did as part of this project was to look at the water sources um and we've got here these are the water bodies these are the um pumps the water pumps we've got the wells we've got the horse troughs and we've got some of the uh, little um, old farms here so uh, it's just something that you can actually derive from earlier uh, ordnance survey data from the 1906 map and put them onto your modern map to see map where uh, structures were where you might find some remains of something or other if you're lucky and as part of the, the project that we did with the Friends of Grace Park, we did actually go and have a look and see what we could find. And one of the things we were finding was the different trees dotted around that we took um, measurements of, took, took some records of. And then we also looked at the um, any sort of boundary features. Um, it was changes in level because it, this just shows us one uh, vast sort of expanse of, uh, of ground and um, there were some old playing fields on but you can show it shows changes of level and these odd trees on there when you look at that on the um on an earlier map it does actually chime in with some of the um uh, old field boundaries but this is just something you know you can just walk about look at features of interest make that make you know make a record of those and then superimpose them onto a, a modern map and look at what you can then find and homing in a little bit in a little bit more detail from the uh, from the last map you can see you know we've got our boundary of some of the old buildings that are superimposed onto the modern the modern structure so within that we know that these are still these are still here they're still in the, the same landscape and then we've got these little orange spots or little starbursts here are actually individual trees that we've mapped and, and recorded and what is really good about using digital mapping and looking superimposing and looking at different maps from different areas putting the information on to um the modern map going out and actually going out into the um park in in this case or going anywhere and seeing if you can see some of the features that might have been there in the landscape 100, 200 years ago. In this case, we've actually got the little orange 
these little orange spots that I showed earlier with the trees that we surveyed and they are superimposed onto this 18th century Shaw, Samuel Shaw's um, bespoke map. And looking at the record, looking at the trees, measuring the trees, we think that these are, if we take the orange spots, these are the actual trees that were depicted on Samuel Shaw's map, which you know is, is a is something that's quite like sort of exciting. And what you can also see is this is a modern Norton Hall, the colonnade and the, the Norton Hall. But underneath it, you can see what was the uh, 17th and earlier century hall buildings, which you can, um, you know, see in the wall, the church churchyard wall, you can still see the bullioned windows that are now being blocked up of this much older building. So we have actually sort of, you know, X marks the spot. And sometimes this is one, one of the beauties of these sorts of maps, that you can actually do all of this and really sort of bring to life um, the older landscape from a modern point of view. Thank you. Just say thank you, thank you, me. <laughs> that's a bit, that's a bit weird. <laughs> so I won't say thank you, me. Um, have anybody got any questions or comments on um, on uh, what what you've just uh, what you've just seen? I mean, some of it it's a bit of a, a whiz through, but some of the other bits, especially the the latter half of it. Uh, that is what we'll be covering in the, the second half of uh, this morning. I have, a, <clears throat> yeah. I have a question. How easy is it to get access to access the old maps? You uh, we will we will show you that a little bit later. Okay. I mean, I mean well, there's there's two answers to that question. There is a there are a few um, archive collections which you can get freely available maps on um, to download from the internet. Right. There are um, others that are paid for, you know, you, you need to pay for, but there's enough out there, and Chris will cover that a little bit later on, that you can play to your heart's content with loads and loads of different maps. Right, okay. Some of the ones that you saw around the Norton Hall estate, we actually had to go into the archive, look in Sheffield archives and other archive collections and ferret the maps out ourselves. And then um, photograph them, digitize them. And then they are then, and again, Chris will come on to how we then actually stick those onto the Ordnance Survey and the other maps there. So, you know, there's an awful lot of maps out there that you can get loads of information on. And, you know, I just sort of scratched the surface of some of the things. I mean, one of the one of the other ones that um, is really that you can get maps from uh, such as Natural England, which Chris will show with some of the things with the different layering of ancient woodlands and all that sort of stuff. There's also the um, another good one is the Woodland Trust the ancient tree inventory. And yeah. that shows, you know, all the trees that are big old, well, not big old trees, but old trees that have been uh, recorded and that have been uploaded onto the, um, in fact, if we have time right at the end, I can maybe have a look at that, that have been uploaded onto their inventory. And what you can then see is what you've got round and about you. And if you're interested in the big old trees, and we found some in Wurlow, in the in the park, at some of the ancient woodland um, the, the other week when we were out there, and I don't think they've they're on the inventory. So one of the things that we'll be doing is actually putting those, doing the full recording, 
which we'll be going on to in some of the later um, workshops. Do you want to find just something about the event for us? Yeah. But if we just put onto um, the records that we can do there, then, you know, we then have that. We can download that map and people can see what's there. <clears> and, and all the rest of it. Go on then, Chris. What do you want to say? Yeah, I was just about to mention about inventories, um, whether it be the ancient tree forum or um, whether it be the um, statutory bodies, such as Natural England. Um, they only have limited surveying resources themselves. Um, so it, it might be easy sometimes to think, oh, this is out of date or it's not accurate. This is where the citizen science element comes in. If you're out mapping and you're out locating these things, they really do appreciate your input on helping to keep their records up to date so everyone benefits. Um, a really good example is, is perhaps the uh, Natural England and Ancient Woodland Inventory. They only release survey data for areas of woodland over two hectares. Um, and they are, or is it acres? It is acres. I don't know if we've gone metric yet. Um, but um, the, it is acres, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but they, again, even Natural England rely on updates from groups and individuals who can confirm that an area is within is within the boundaries and does qualify, does meet the criteria of ancient woodland. Um, and similar with, um, with with tree recorders who are better placed on their little patch to find these individual trees of note, to find these old specimens which have escaped these records. Um, the, the ancient woodland inventory was uh, before citizen science was invented as a name. That's how it all. That's how it actually came about. It was a big project that was done to start to record all of the large old trees, and it through the ancient tree forum, and now the wood, wood the woodland trust now manages and monitors that. So you know the yes, the, the anything like that be very. But as soon as these things are, are on a record and they're publicly available, it. It strengthens um, management argument as well, and it, it, it strengthens your argument perhaps against poor planning decisions. The fact that these things have been recognised, they've been verified, and that they're, they're, they're a matter of record. Um, that's it, you know, it, it strengthens your argument in terms of future planning and management considerations. Um, so so it, it, if you think, oh, I've only recorded a couple of trees, if you submit that data, then that's it, it's, it's on the record and it's, it's there, it's fixed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Has anybody else got any other questions or observations? So, anything, or have we all stunned you into, <laughs> stunned you into silence? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Caroline. <laughs> Do you want to unmute yourself? You're still on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, that's it. It's okay. <laughs> well, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting, and I was very impressed that the the old map of the estate superimposed so clearly on the modern one. Their te techniques, even though they were primitive, must have been very accurate. It's uh, lovely. Yeah. Um, and are there any um, ordnance survey maps in between the 1906 and the 1956, which you um, mentioned? Yes, yes, there are. Um, I think, do you go into some of that? Uh, we've got, um, we, I don't think we've, we haven't got the full series um, on our presentations today, uh -huh. but there are, it's the 19, for the Whirlow area, I think I'm yeah. right on to this. It's the 1923, 1924, and then the 1947-53 right. area. But we'll we'll cover some of that a little bit later. Um, what what we're going to do? So I, I should sort of expect is that what what we're doing with the group at the moment is gathering uh, some a lot of the like the baseline data. 
So what Chris is doing is producing a whole series of maps from sort of the early, you know, pre pre Willow Brook Park Hall, etc., through to where we can get up to sort of like the nineteen seventies. Lovely. And look at, and look at all of those. We'll. Um, in Chris's presentation, you'll see how you can download some of those and get them from the uh, National Library of Scotland um, website, uh, which, it, which I'll explain there. And then we can look at how they will then be sort of like superimposed on, on each of them. I mean, the, the 1928 map that I showed uh, with Wurlow on, the uh, annotate it was an annotated map from the 90 from 1923 1924 right which was probably surveyed um a few years before that because it takes a few it took, mm. then then it took a few years for them to translate all the surveyors things onto at the big mm. big pieces of paper to then go and copy copy them all up i mean now with all the satellite um that we get you know the they can update the OS data, you know, like next week or something. <laughs> These new things come on, but then it was a little bit more, um, a little bit more long-winded. But yes, there are more uh, maps, and there, there are maps at different scales mm -hmm. as well, so that have you know, lots of different levels of detail. Thank you. These basics and how they can be applied to the project. We begin with an overall introduction to GPS and GIS software, followed by a short example of fieldwork, and then we look at how those data can be used in a variety of ways as presented in map form. We begin with a question. What is digital mapping and GIS? The Geographic Information System technology is a computerised framework for gathering, managing and analysing data and creating digital maps. Digital maps rely heavily upon data, sometimes in very large quantities. The principle used by which digital mapping has grown has been its connection to global positioning systems, along with high quality satellite imagery and often freely available sets of data. We'll cover these later. What are the advantages of digital mapping? Well, many can be obtained and downloaded for free. Digital maps, not being sold in shops by and large, are instead available online and many can be downloaded under freely accessible public licenses. Freely available data to support your work. For example, there are a great many environmental and species databases, weather, census and demographic data sets, again, all available under public license. Maps can be easily updated. Digital maps are mostly real-time representations of an area and can therefore be updated easily because the changes will be updated automatically. Digital maps are not limited to show only a specific area based on scale. They can be widened to show an entire area, which is called spatial analysis, both historical and in the present. Also, datasets can be combined to show relationships through time and space. They are good at showing an area and data overlays from various angles. Digital maps do not only show 2D representations of an area. They can be used to show the 3D angle of an area and also the area overlays, and again these will be covered later in this presentation. So what is it used for? Well, just about anything you can think of. The examples here are just a small selection of the number of uses to which geographical information system software can be used. The web link at the bottom will take you to a superb website which outlines the many and myriad uses for which GIS is used. This poses an interesting question. Are paper maps a thing of the past? Well, some of the disadvantages of paper maps do include they can go out of date quickly, they can be expensive, and they can be prone to damage. I mean, plenty of us have been out in the field and had to deal with a soggy map. Well, an answer to that question is no. There are plenty of advantages to paper maps. They become a valuable archive of how a landscape, its use and occupation have changed over time. For example, changes in woodland cover, mapping old and ancient tracks and boundaries, name changes in the landscape, and a myriad other uses which can be built up in layers to show that change over time. So how is this applicable to Wurlow? Mapping where things are. Using waypoints. Features such as vegetation, buildings, etc. can be plotted. 
using routes can record linear or irregular features such as trackways or boundaries and find out what is or was nearby by using selective features such as woodland relationships between features can be identified ancient trackways woodland old and new settlements etc and mapping change historical maps can be combined with modern maps and satellite imagery to map those changes over time this is known as map regression and again, we'll touch on this a little later in this presentation. So what are the tools of the trade? Well, a PC or laptop, obviously. Some kind of GPS receiver, we'll look at these shortly, and a GIS program. Oh, and the critically important piece of kit. So what is GPS? GPS, the Global Positioning System, is a satellite-based system that allows anyone with a GPS receiver to find their exact position anywhere in the world. GPS is used as an aid in navigation, for example in aircraft, in boats, and by hikers. The GPS receiver uses signals from satellites to calculate its latitude, longitude, and elevation. Most receivers also have the capability to store locations, known as waypoints, sequences of locations that make up a planned route, and a track log or track of the receiver's movement over time. Waypoints, routes, and tracks are the three basic feature types in GPS data. Other than a rather expensive GPS receiver, what other options are there? Today there's a mobile phone or tablet. Both tablets and mobile phones, either Android or iPhone, have a number of usually free GPS receivers to download from either Google Play for Android or the Apple App Store for iPhones. And it's certainly a cost-effective way of going surveying. Of course, once you've been out surveying, you'll have collected lots of data, but you're going to need somewhere to put it. This introduces the Geographical Information System software, or GIS. For many years, GIS software was prohibitively expensive, and really just for the realm of the professional. However, in recent years, with the explosion of free open source software coming onto the market, this has allowed development of QGIS. Previously known as Quantum GIS, it's a free, open source, cross-platform desktop geographic information system application that supports viewing, editing, and analysis of geospatial data. It can store, manipulate, and display all types of data and present them in map form. The latest stable version is currently QGIS 3.22. So once you've downloaded and installed QGIS, what can you do with it? Obviously, you can view data, or you can explore data and compose and print maps. You can explore and share 2 and 3D maps. You can create edit, manage and export data. Basic information, such as point data, obtained from waypoints, is one of the most common types of information displayed on simple digital maps. Linear data, boundaries and trackways, is also common. We'll now go on to look at the basics. This is the basic QGIS view and workspace. At the top are numerous tools used to import and manipulate maps and data sources. The upper left hand panel acts as a file explorer and quick links to various online resources. Whilst the lower left hand panel is the layers panel. Here, data presented in layers is displayed in the sequence it appears in the main viewing panel. Most time is spent here, the main viewing panel, plus a number of the frequently used tools on the upper toolbars. Although self explanatory, it is worth noting that the items on this slide can be sourced from a number of locations. For example, data layers can be downloaded as data sets from, for example, Natural England. They could be a scanned map, a satellite image, or indeed, your own field surveying data. It can all be imported as a layer and formed and stacked up and moved around to present the data in the best way you want to see it. Here we have a very basic map showing just a base layer street map, in this case supplied by OpenStreetMaps, and just a handful of waypoints. These were fixed using a mobile phone app. Here we have the same waypoints combined with the track that was taken at the same time and again overlaid onto the OpenStreetMap data. This just forms a very simple and easy map which shows a route taken and points of interest marked along that route. This combined data from layers map is actually taken from a bus ride We've got the usual street map behind it. We have the route, we have the tracks, and the orange blobs represent waypoints which were put in by the user, uh, in that case, me. Here, 
we'll be looking at using historic maps overlaid onto the modern map, showing how a landscape has changed. This particular example is from a project that we have been involved in recently, looking at a major aerodrome site, which has now completely disappeared, in Norton, Sheffield. <coughs> Here the first slide is just looking at the straightforward modern street map and suburbs of Norton. This is the historic map we will be using. It is actually number two Northern Aircraft Repair Depot. The aerodrome itself was a large facility. We want to see what this looks like overlaid onto the modern landscape so we can fix the historic boundaries into the modern landscape and use that as a basis for fieldwork. Properly manipulated in QGIS, we now have the historic landscape overlaid onto the modern landscape and we can see exactly where the boundaries were and exactly where the buildings were from all the areas of the aerodrome. This did in fact form the basis of some very interesting field walks which produced some rather interesting results, certainly some unexpected results. The following set of slides show a combination of both historic data, modern satellite and mapping and botanical data. The project was to map the locations of ancient woodland indicator species which aren't necessarily now within the boundaries of ancient woodlands. Rather, are they showing the sites of ancient woodlands and wood pasture on the eastern moors just outside Sheffield. These screen grabs are taken from the main viewing panel and on the left hand side a rather busy layers panel. As you can see it lists primarily plant species and these are colour coded and the dots appropriately marked on the map. So how does this correspond with the historic landscape? Here we have the same species list and this time we have overlaid the historic 25 inch Ordnance Survey maps and we start to see that the woodland indicator species do in fact form some sort of correlation between areas of former and in some cases current wood pasture. To make this data easy to see and understand the areas of wood pasture have been highlighted in a smoky grey colour again this is using another layer and it allows us to see where the indicator species are clearly in relation to areas of wood pasture. Here we're looking at historic and modern field observation data. This is a really good example of freely available open access data. The lime green areas are in fact from the Natural England Ancient Woodland Inventory Survey, a major nationwide survey which is updated regularly. It's one of many that Natural England do, all of which are very, very useful. Just visible on the right hand side of the map just upper of centre is Whirlow. Again the left hand column shows a list of layers some of which are active some of which are not presenting the data that we want to use on this particular map. We are now adding several more layers of data to the map in this case ancient woodland indicators. As we can see there are an awful lot of ancient woodland indicators clustered around ancient woodlands as you'd expect. Equally there are an awful lot outside of the boundaries of ancient woodlands. Some of these exist in surviving upland wood pasture, but many don't. We have now added more layers to our field observation data. These are more habitat areas, again supplied by Natural England. Uh, for example, we have uh, wood pasture, we have mixed woodland, we have coniferous woodland, and we have the ancient woodland already mentioned. So to briefly conclude this opening presentation we can see that GPS and GIS are powerful tools for mapping. They can help interpret landscapes easily, they can present data in many ways which can be understood easily. Advantages include freely available data and the ability to manipulate and add to that data once within a GIS program. Christine Handley will now take us briefly through the basic steps of surveying a location on a field trip, acquiring data using the free mobile phone app, a GPS tracker. We're out today at Crooks Valley Park to have a, a short walk round so that we can test out and demonstrate use of a GPS tracker a mobile phone app which will enable us to plot points of interest and put them onto 
a digital map. This is a short demonstration, uh, starting off at the first point, just to make sure that we're on the track and we've got the start of the walk round. This is the first screen that you see once you've started to do a recorder of a track and you click onto the start button and then that will actually activate the little green triangle that you can see in the middle there which says that's where we're actually starting. When we want to make a track we, act, we press onto the red button just above where it says record which we've got to press the record and you'll get the screen which says new point of interest. For this particular example we've just put testing but as you'll see as we do our walk round we'll be describing what we're actually going to be what we're actually seeing and once we've put the next point in you'll see that there's a little check mark little round red which says that we've actually recorded that so here we are in Crooks Valley Park walking along the top level look, just looking for points of interest and we don't just have to do actual physical things we can actually look at a viewpoint so we can look at that and record that we've actually seen something which is of interest and that's the view that we will see from the viewpoint Has it now come? Yeah, yeah we've got it Okay This presentation briefly looks at importing the basic data we acquired on our walk around Crooks Valley Park. It is not, in and of itself, a tutorial. Rather, we will go through the basic steps, resulting in a simple, clear map. The data from the mobile phone app must be installed manually. However, the file format is a standard one, so it is fully supported. This part of any mapping project is really the heavy lifting section along with georeferencing, which we'll look at shortly. Once we have completed the groundwork, so to speak, we will have any number of maps and data sets with which to work more quickly. At this stage, it may look as though there is a lot of clicking around, opening dialog boxes, choosing settings and importing data. Well, there is. It does become rather easier with a little practice and experience, but on a project such as Whirlow, once set up, it will become a series of simple additions and maintenance tasks. We continue at a slightly accelerated pace, adding and changing the various properties and attributes of the raw imported data to make our map clearer and easier to understand. It is useful on a project such as Whirlo to decide on a house style. This ensures curatorial jobs on the mapping element of the project are made simpler. Standardised symbols and colours etc. are also a great aid to the end user. The final job is to import the labels from the GPX data. These can, as with all other map properties and attributes, be changed as desired from within QGIS. We start with two questions. What is georeferencing? Giving us yet another definition of terminology. And secondly, why? A standard definition of georeferencing is the process of taking a digital image it could be an air photo, scanned geological map or a picture of a topographical map and adding geographic information to the image so that GIS or other mapping software can place the image in its appropriate real world location. This process is completed by selecting pixels in the digital map and assigning them a geographic coordinate. In rare instances one may already know the geographic coordinates of certain pixels in an image. More frequently, a non-georeferenced image is a georeference to an existing image that already has embedded geographic information. Or, put more simply, we'll be adding points on maps. We have seen already examples of historic maps included in various QGIS projects. They have all been georeferenced, and the following answers not only how, briefly, this is done, but importantly, why. Firstly, we need a couple more tools. Google Earth and a graphics program. I'm using GIMP 2.1 for this, but any will do. 
We now move on to the maps. There are several ways of acquiring maps for inclusion in a QGIS project. In this example, we will use one of the best free repositories of large-scale early edition ordnance survey maps online, the National Library of Scotland. The NLS map library is large, but easy to navigate, meaning selecting a map sheet is a really straightforward job. These large-scale ordnance survey maps are always a good foundation for the historic map element, as even older maps are significantly easier to match to them than trying to, say, pair a 17th century map to the 21st century landscape. We now have to start the process of jumping and clicking around, again. It is a necessary evil, but as mentioned earlier, this is part of the background preparation and once completed is out of the way, with the maps only being called upon when needed. Once selected, the map is screen grabbed, dropped into your image editor, cropped and saved, and we can now start the georeferencing, or sticking pins in maps, just very accurately. The process starts properly with Google Earth. The image is imported as an overlay and needs to be moved, resized and cajoled into matching the landscape beneath it. Fiddly? Yeah, it can be, but these particular maps are easy to locate. We now add our pins into the corners, or as near as possible, of our map, and then save. This gives that pin a geo-reference a very accurate map reference. All of the corners are pinned and we now import this into QGIS via the georeferencer. We need to know where we are, so we expand the side browser and select the type of base map we want. Once set up we can start to import our own map. We carefully replicate the pin locations from Google Earth into the georeferencer. Sadly, there is no copy-paste here, so swapping between the two is necessary to make sure the coordinates are accurately typed. All four corners are pinned and properties set. The map is now imported into our QGIS project, and there's always a sigh of relief here. Always. We will now select a second map of a later date from the same source, to the same scale. The process for georeferencing is the same, so we'll go through this quickly. The result will be two maps, of different dates, geolocated as accurately as possible. There is always a mismatch to a greater or lesser degree with scanned maps, even online. This begins to answer the question, why? Here, we have two maps, of different published dates to the same scale, which, in one instant, can easily examine localised changes in landscape and use in a known time frame. We can see where and how the landscape has changed and what has affected that change. To conclude that why, perhaps that is the most important in understanding how and why these changes have happened. It helps inform policy and management decisions now and in the future, where the increased pressures of climate change must now finally be factored in.